My name is Dan Rogers and I'm a consultant gastroenterologist at University Hospitals of Leicester. Today we're going to spend about five minutes reviewing how to assess a patient with upper GI haemorrhage. After completing this podcast you may be interested to view the rest of the series through which you will cover the management of upper GI haemorrhage and the pathology behind its causes. Upper GI haemorrhage has significant morbidity and mortality associated with it and the mortality rates have not altered in the past 20 years. They remain around 10% for patients admitted to hospital with upper GI bleeding and 25% for those who suffer a bleed while in hospital for another reason. Although it may therefore seem we've made little progress in the management of these patients, the age of patients presenting with this condition has increased and so the patients presenting tend to be sicker and have more comorbidities, which may in part account for lack of progress at decreasing death rates. Upper GI bleeding is a common presentation and most hospitals can expect to admit at least one patient a day. Although some causes of GI bleeding may be decreasing in frequency with greater awareness of the risk factors, it's likely that the incidence will continue to increase overall as the prevalence of liver disease continues to increase worldwide and so it's important that all clinicians are competent to manage such patients. At this point it is also useful to note that GI bleeding causes significant anxiety among clinicians of all grades and hopefully after completing this series you will feel less anxious when assessing and managing these patients. On this slide you can see a patient with active bleeding from esophageal varices on the left and an arterial spurt from a Judifoy's lesion on the right. After seeing these images you can understand why these patients can be so unwell. The most important assessment is to decide if the patient is actually bleeding. Hematemesis is the vomiting of fresh blood, whereas coffee ground vomiting may be altered blood but can also be due to a number of other causes as most vomit will have some flecks of brown colour irrespective of the cause. Molina is the passage of dark, black, sticky, tarry stools and is suggestive of a more significant upper GI bleed. Hemochesia is red blood past per rectum and is normally caused by bleeding in the lower GI tract but can occur if upper GI bleeding is particularly brisk. Hemochesia from upper GI bleeding tends to result in a hemodynamically unstable patient. This slide shows the endoscopic findings of patients who presented with upper GI bleeding during the UK National Upper GI Bleed Audit in 2007. Not all of these will be the cause of the bleed, but it's worth noting that ulcers were found in 36% of patients and varices in 11%. The incidence of varices had increased from 4% only 10 years previously and it's likely to continue to increase. Whilst taking the history and examining your patient, it is important to make some inquiry as to the likely cause of the bleeding. Has your patient been taking NSAIDs, which may make you think about ulcer disease? Retching prior to the bleeding starting would make you think of a malary vice tear, and a previous aortic aneurysm repair may make you think about aortoenteric fistula, which needs to be diagnosed with an urgent CT scan. If your patient's known to have liver disease, has risk factors for liver disease such as high alcohol intake, fatty liver disease or viral hepatitis, or clinical stigmata of portal hypertension on examination, you would be suspicious that varices may be causing the bleeding. Most of the tests on this slide will not come as a surprise and so we will skip through them quickly. It is worth mentioning the renal function as we're particularly looking for the level of urea, which is often raised out of proportion to the creatinine in a patient having an upper GI bleed, and also to remember to send blood for a group and save or cross match depending on the severity of bleeding. It may also sound very obvious, but do remember to place at least one large IV cannula at the same time as taking your blood tests. You will undoubtedly have got a feel for how bad the bleed is whilst talking to the patient and your examination findings will confirm or refute this. In particular, what is their blood pressure and pulse and what is their capillary refill time? In the next three slides we will look at more formal ways of assessing the severity of bleeding that should help you decide if the patient needs a blood transfusion and the urgency of any endoscopic investigations together with the likelihood of the bleed being significantly severe enough to lead to the patient's death. This slide has been taken from the trauma literature and gives you an idea how much blood has been lost. We don't need to labour the points but you can see that both systolic and diastolic blood pressure together with pulse, respiratory rate and mental state are all good markers as to the severity of bleeding. The Rockle score is useful at giving you a prediction of the likelihood of death being caused by this episode of GI bleeding. The score comes in two parts, a pre-endoscopy score and a post-endoscopy score. The pre-endoscopy score is very easy to calculate with bedside tests and history taking and a score of 4 or above is associated with a high risk of death. Only the post-endoscopy score is fully validated and again a score above 4 suggests a markedly increased risk of death. 
The score and the mortality rates associated with each score are available to download beneath this podcast window. You can see from this slide that the Blatchford score is more difficult to calculate as you require the results of blood tests as well as clinical parameters. However, it, is an, it does have an advantage over the Rockle score as it predicts the need for intervention in the form of blood transfusion or endoscopy. A patient with a score of zero should be safe to discharge home without inpatient endoscopy and those with scores of one to three should be considered fairly low risk. Scores above three are associated with a much higher need for intervention and these patients should certainly be kept in hospital for further assessment and management. It is however important to remember that neither of these scoring systems replace good clinical judgement and if your gut instinct is to be concerned about the patient you should go with this irrespective of the risk score. Again the Blatchford score is available to download beneath this podcast window. The further podcasts in this series are below and all other resources can be found on our Scoopit page. Thank you for listening. This talk has been provided by the Leicester Gonda Collaborative Teaching Project.